I really do come to you this morning with a heavy heart, with a heavy heart and great sadness because of the events that are taking place in Ukraine. And what happens in Ukraine is directly related to what happens in the Middle East, and obviously we know that what happens in the Middle East is vital to the existence of the State of Israel. I'm not going to go through the history of Ukraine with you, but the fact is Crimea is a sovereign part of the sovereign nation of Ukraine. And the people of Ukraine, by the hundreds of thousands, went to a square in sub-freezing weather that's saying that they did not want to be part of Putin's Russia. And that's what it was all about. And now, now that the Olympics are over, immediately afterwards, we now see the occupation of Crimea. And by the way, in case you missed it, one of the reasons why there's a majority population of Russians in Crimea is because Stalin exported all the Tartars, over half of them were killed as he drove, deported them from the Crimea. But the fact is that this is a blatant act on the part of Vladimir Putin and one that must be unacceptable to the world community. It cannot stand. And I've and I have to be very honest with you, there is not a military option that could be exercised now, but the most powerful and biggest and strongest nation in the world should have plenty of opt options. And those options are many, ranging from identifying these, these klepto, uh, kleptocrats, these corruption people and the people that ordered this and the Magnitsky Act. Thank God for the Magnitsky Act. We could expand it and identify those people and it would be their last trip to Las Vegas. So we can, we can act, enact our economic sanctions. We can, uh, ha, there's a broad array of options that we have. Why do we care? Because this is the ultimate result of a feckless foreign policy where nobody believes in America's strength anymore. In 2009, many of you may remember, as we saw on, uh, on YouTube, we saw a, a young woman named Netta bleed to death in the street in Tehran when the people of, of, of Iran rose up and said, Obama, Obama, are, we, are you with us or are you, are you with us or are you with them? And you know what? The President of the United States didn't say a word. The President of the United States believes that the Cold War is over. That's fine, it is over, but Putin doesn't believe it's over. He doesn't believe that, the, uh, that this is a zero-sum game. Look at Moldova, look at the occupation of Georgia, look at the pressure on the Baltic nations, look at what they're doing in assisting Bashar Assad slaughter tens of thousands of innocent people in cities and towns and countryside all over Syria. It is an outrage, and these people, and Vladimir Putin, and Vladimir Putin, while he is cooperating with us in the removal of chemical weapons, plane load after plane load of regular weapons, of artillery, of rockets, of tanks, are landing at the airport in Damascus, slaughtering innocent people. And I will tell you, it's hard for a mother to differentiate whether their child has been killed by a chemical weapon or one of these horrible barrel bombs that are basically cluster bombs that are being dropped on innocent civilians all over Syria. And we have watched, sat by, and watched it happen. And if, if Bashar Assad prevails, it will directly endanger the security of the state of Israel. And this is now turned into a regional conflict. Lebanon is destabilized. What do you think those Hezbollah, 5,000 Hezbollah fighters are going to be like when they return from the fighting in Syria to southern Lebanon? What do you think is going to happen if Bashar Assad continues to prevail as far as the other nations in the region are concerned? Jordan, probably our best friend, is, un is destabilized. The whole situation is, cries out for American leadership, and I'm sorry to tell you, it's MIA. Now let me also... Um, <laughs> by the way, uh, a couple of my favorites, um, uh, tell Vladimir that I'll be more flexible when I'm reelected. Tell Vladimir I'll be more flexible when I'm reelected. 
Uh, I, I want to talk about Iran a, a minute with you because there is a significant difference of opinion even here amongst our dear friends as to whether sanctions should be passed by the Congress of the United States if the talks fail. And my argument to you is, do you believe that in light of recent events of the last five years that the Iranian mullahs think we're serious? I don't think so. I don't think so. I believe the Iranian people can have access to peaceful civilian nuclear energy, but that doesn't require an industrial uranium enrichment program. It doesn't require a heavy water reactor. It doesn't require advanced centrifuges. And it certainly doesn't require nuclear facilities dug deep into mountains. I hope, as you do, that we can find a peaceful resolution to this crisis. And the only reason there may be a modest chance for that now is because of your tireless efforts and support. Thank you and God bless you for your tireless effort and support. I believe we have to keep the pressure on. Iran's rulers must know that the only alternative to compromising on our terms is even more crippling sanctions or worse. And that's why I believe the Senate should pass new bipartisan sanctions legislation that would take effect if the current negotiations don't, negotiations don't succeed. We must stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapons capability, and we must do so because of the nature of the threat po posed by this Iranian regime. It's not an arms control challenge. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard is in Syria slaughtering people today. They are training these extremists, and they will not quit. This regime in Iran is the world's leading sponsor of terror. It has murdered Americans, Israelis, and Jews across the globe. It is categorically devoted to the destruction of the state of Israel. It is training and arming militant groups across the Middle East. It's destabilizing its neighbors and meddling in their affairs. It's developing sophisticated ballistic weapon missiles, including ICBMs that could target America, and more than any foreign actor, the blood of Syria. When a president of the United States says that that president's going to take military action and does not, that sends a message all the way around the globe as out us. You did the right thing, and I commend you for it. You know, a lot of my fellow countrymen say, we're weary of war. We want to get out. We're, we're, I, I see, hear this phrase over and over again. Uh, there'll never be another land war which the United States in, engages in. Do you know how many times in history that's been said? Do you know how many times prior to World War II when, the Hit, when Hitler marched into the Sudetenland and when Neville Chamberlain said, we're not going to fight in a faraway country for people that don't speak our language and we don't know? My friends, the lessons of history are that we have to be ready. And as Ronald Reagan used to say, peace through strength, not through weakness, and not through cutting our defense budget back to the smallest army prior than we've had since prior to World War II. So with you, my friends, I see Americans who want our country to be engaged in events beyond our borders. I see Americans who want an internationalist foreign policy. I see an Americans who want our country to stand with Israel and our other partners. I see Americans who are willing to spend their hard-earned tax dollars on effective foreign assistance and to strengthen the greatest military the world has ever known. I see here today Americans who want America to lead. My friends, I've been around a long time. In fact, since the Coolidge administration. But <laughs> I would say to you, I have never seen this world in need of strong American leadership than it is today. 
And I believe the events of these agreement, these negotiations with Iran, which I hope to succeed, but I doubt. When I see the slaughter in Syria, when I see the Chinese asserting themselves in Asia, when I see in response cuts, significant cuts in foreign aid and also in our defense budget, I'm worried. My final word to you, my dear and beloved friends, America needs and Israel needs you more today than ever before. Thank you and God bless.